Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here in, in your midst uh, this morning, and I thank you, uh, the leadership of this church anyway, uh, for inviting my wife and I here for the weekend. We've had a great weekend uh, with your care group leaders, with your council members, uh, a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, joy, and learning maybe together. Um, my, my name again is Ian Wildeboer, and my wife is Nadia, and we are pastoring a church in East Hamilton, much like Pathway. In fact, I think um, your average age is one year older than us. At 27, we're at 26, uh, so we have a young congregation as well. And I think you have one more uh, community member than we do. So um, our numbers are very, very similar. So it's a very, very similar context and I think similar story. Uh, when you started, uh, I think in 2019, if that's correct, we also started then. Uh, so the race is on. No, just kidding. Um, but the Lord has blessed us. And listening to your story as well, the Lord has blessed you. And it's a blessing then uh, to share in this joy together. So what I want to do today is uh, I have a two-part series with you today uh, on questions Jesus answered. Uh, this is what we're doing at Mercy over the next uh, maybe six months. I'm look, working through the book of Luke, uh, the gospel according to Luke, and we're answering questions, or Jesus is answering questions that, we're, that the Bible or people are asking Jesus, and we're just working through them. And it's been a real joy over the last month at Mercy to be walking through these questions and more brilliantly, the answers. Uh, Jesus is so good at answering questions. I don't know if you know that, but if you don't know anything about Jesus, he's really good at answering questions. So, we're going to open our Bibles this morning uh, to Ephesians chapter 6. And it's in the context of the, the wilderness where Jesus is and is tempted by the devil. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10, talks about uh, the armor of God, our, our battle the battle of the ages, you could say, against the devil and his minions. And so we're going to read that together, and then uh, we're going to read our text after that, um, shortly after that. So let us open our Bibles again to Ephesians chapter 6. I think it's on the screen behind me, uh, beginning at verse 10. There we read. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand, stand there for having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as for shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayers and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So that's Ephesians. Paul is writing about our battle. And Jesus uh, faces the battle uh, straight up. He faces the battle against the devil in what we call the wilderness temptations. And we're going to read about that in Luke chapter 4. So let's turn again now to Luke chapter 4. This is what we're gonna, I'm going to preach on this morning, uh, the temptations of Jesus. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when the days were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And said to him, to you I will give all this authority and their glory. For it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will be all yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, 
and him only shall you serve. And he took him uh, to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. So loved ones in the Lord Jesus Christ, this morning we're going to consider here the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness. And our Savior was tested. And our Savior won that test and every other test that was placed against him. I just want to remind you as we enter our text this morning that you're also being tested. And until you breathe your last breath, even on the deathbed, you will be tested by the devil. You are at war. Remember that. The apostle Peter reminds us, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. That someone is us. And as I prepared this sermon, I found it alarming, and maybe you know this as well, that we live in an age that seems to be playing fast and loose with devil worship. Satan worship is on the rise, in particular in public high schools. Groups are forming where they're just spending time worshiping the devil and seeking his power. And I think this is very alarming. But as I was preparing this sermon, there's something even more alarming that we should be aware of. And that is this. According to one Gallup poll in the U.S., because they all come into the U.S., the evangelical church is said to say, in the Gallup poll in the evangelical church, that said that 52% of Christians believe that there is a devil. 52% of Christians believe that there's a devil. And the question is, what about the other 48%? What do they believe? Well, the other 48% say, we don't know if there's a demonic force or, sorry, if there's a devil. The other part of that 48% say, well, we don't really know. We know there's some kind of evil in this world, some kind of force that's not good, kind of like bad karma. It exists. That's 48% of the church not sure whether the devil actually exists. And that should alarm you. The devil is real. Make no mistake about it. The devil wants you to believe that he doesn't exist. Make no mistake about it. And he's still your greatest enemy until the day you die. This story reminds us again afresh as we enter it this morning that the, that the devil is real. Jesus knows that. Jesus faced off with him. He's a personal being with a will, with a rational mind, and he's the consummate total of evil. That's the devil. And so the question is ultimately this. When we enter this passage, and Jesus is answering this for us, it's an implied question. It's not straight in your face. But as you confront the devil, as you face off with the devil, and it's a daily reality, The question is ultimately this, can you trust God's word against his lies? Can you trust God's word against his lies? When tempted, when the lies of the devil come our way to sin, does God's word word stand up against that pressure as our ready and sure defense? Is it that powerful that we can depend on it in the face of every single one of our temptations? And just, to, just so you know, uh, spoiler alert, you, you can. It is. It, it's, 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 it's worthy of its, of its gold. It, it, it stands the test of time. So I, I just, but I want to unpack that this morning. I want to unpack this theme. Can we uh, trust the word of God? Can we believe the word of God in the face of temptation? Whether it's the tempted, being tempted by what we would call the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eyes or the pride of the heart or the pride of life. So do we, can we face off with, with, with these temptations, understanding and believing the word of God against the temptation against physical needs, a temptation for power and security, a temptation for status and fame. 
So we're going to begin with our physical needs, and, and this has often been called the, the, the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. Now before we enter our text, before we unpack uh, these verses before us, it's, it's important to know that the temptations of Jesus, the temptations Jesus faced, were unique to Jesus. There's not going to be a day when you're going to be tempted to try to turn a stone to a piece of bread, or for a high school student, a stone to a Big Mac. That, that, that's not going to happen. You're not going to be tempted that way. You're not going to be tempted by seeing all the kingdoms of the world, and all you have to do is bend your knee to the devil to be able to have the power over that. Not even Chi Ching Ping has that kind of opportunity at his disposal. And neither are you going to be encouraged to jump 450 feet from a very high point and let the angels swoop you up in this power unknown to humanity. That's not going to be a temptation for you. These temptations are unique to Jesus Christ. Having said that, what these temptations represent are common to each of us. That's our landing point. What these temptations represent is common to each of us. And so as we enter our text, know that we're going to work through this context, realizing that Jesus faced off with the devil, defeated him, but these temptations still exist in different forms and common to each of us. So we begin, verse 1. When, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I, I don't know if you heard that. Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. Just think about that. We think about this in a, in a context, of course, of what was happening in Jesus' life. And if you were to read chapter 3, right before our chapter, we realize that Jesus was baptized. We get these words from Luke 3, verse 21. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form, like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That's, that's happening just before our text. Maybe a day before, or the same day even that he was led into the wilderness. So preceding our text, we have the baptism of Jesus. And that's important. Now, to be clear, and I think this was answered a few weeks ago by your pastor, this baptism of Jesus was an act of righteous obedience by Christ. So you know why he was baptized. It's not a baptism for his repentance or his forgiveness of sins, because he was not a sinner. Now, Jesus was baptized in order to identify with his people who needed to be baptized and who needed to find their identity now in Jesus, who was going to show them the reason for the baptism. But it's also important to notice that it was also an entry into his office. Jesus the priest, Jesus the high priest, Jesus the, the, the king, Jesus the prophet was going to be appointed now, commissioned you could say, and, and the Holy Spirit was given to him to fulfill his ministry. So he was full of the Holy Spirit and the first port of call for our Savior once he started his ministry was the wilderness. And in the wilderness, the devil. That's where he starts. Jesus was going to face off with the greatest enemy of all of history in a God-forsaken piece of real estate. You don't have that here in this part of the country. You got a lot of nice real estate here. But, but picture a wilderness. And so we're going to help you picture a wilderness just briefly. Some of you have never seen a wilderness before. You get to see lots of big trees. But this is a wilderness picture um, in the Judean wilderness where Jesus went. It's a God-forsaken piece of real estate. Should you be driving by on a tourist bus, because that's typically what you do now if you're going to go to Israel, you're like, I hope the bus doesn't stop here. <laughs> can, we, can we just keep on going, please? It's desolate, it's barren, it's lonely, it's dry. The only animals that you can find that find a home there are said to be snakes, scorpions, and spiders. It lacks shade, its water is scarce, the nights are cold, the days are hot. Jesus was alone, and he was hungry for 40 days there. Being alone can be a real test to one's integrity. Being alone in a God-forsaken place is an even greater test to one's integrity. 
Remember that when you're alone and tempted in the warmth of your bedroom. What Jesus had to go through for your salvation. It began in a lonely, dry, and weary place. And then we read, for 40 days being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. Scripture has an amazing ability to state the understatements of, of life. He was hungry. Yes, he was extremely hungry after 40 days. They say that if you fast for a period of time, the first three days are intense, are very, very difficult. Your metabolism is working overtime, and you feel every single hunger pain out there known to humanity. But after about three or four days, you kind of go into a bit of a comatose, and your system just shuts, shuts right down. They say that this happens for about four or five weeks. It's like, okay, I'm hungry, but I can just kind of exist. You get really tired. But they say about the fifth week or the sixth week, your, your body begins to want to feast on itself, and it gets extremely hungry again. So, so commentators are arguing that by the time Jesus met the 40th day of not eating, he was extremely hungry. Could you imagine? And that's when he's put to the test. That's when Satan seems to show up right at that point. I'm just going to tell you something about Satan. He's an opportunist for sure. But he's also tactical. He's also very tactical. He's smart. He knows how, how, to, how to pounce. He knows how to desire this time at this place to tempt his people. And, and, and I want you just to tell you this morning that that's the same, that nothing has changed with the devil. He's still tactical. He's still an opportunist. In some ways, he still preys on vulnerability. It's been said that when you do business with God, the more likely the devil wants to do business with you. When you do business with God, the more likely the devil wants to do business with you. And, and it's true, even on a personal level, uh, the more you're committed to walking with Jesus, the more you delight to do his will. The devil seems to be right there running interference, trying to pull you away from that commitment, trying to pull you away from that desire to serve him with all of your heart. It begins even in the morning with personal devotions. There are a thousand ways the devil can distract you from walking with, in faith and in devotion to the Lord even in the beginning of the day. I know, I've been there, like every morning. And then it goes into prayer time. You, you know, people invite you to gather for prayer. You know, I don't have time for prayer. Or I'm too busy to pray or... Uh, why, would I, why would I leave my room, to, my house, to, to pray with other men or other women? Uh, running distraction, running interference. Theologian J.C. Ryle said, Nowhere, perhaps, is the devil more active than in the church. When you do want to do business with God in church, Satan comes and says, you don't need to do that. You don't need to go to church. You don't need to seek for unity in the church. You don't need to listen. You don't need to let the gospel change you every single Sunday. So he runs distractions, distractions, distractions. You're thinking about the week. You're thinking about your to-do list or the beautiful mountains. I don't know if you think about them, but I, when I'm here, I'm like thinking about the mountains like all the time. They're so beautiful. <laughs> He's tactical. He preys on vulnerability. And so he says, if you are the son of God, command the stone to become bread. That's the first temptation. Really, you should read it this way. Since you are the Son of God, let this stone become bread. Since. And I just want to think about the devil here. He knows about Jesus' divinity. The only people out there that don't believe that Jesus is divine are, 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 are the liberals and the cults. They, they, they extract him from his divinity. But Satan, the, the worst enemy in the world, knows that Jesus is divine. He says, since you are the Son of God, because you are, I've witnessed you in glory, I know who you are, but since you are that being, turn these stones into bread. What's he asking Jesus to do? Well, from a simple read, it seems that he's just asking Jesus to alleviate his hunger. Seems very kind of the devil to think that way. But behind the temptation is a question. And this is the question of the ages, you understand. Here's the question. Does your father really love you? Did he not just say, you are my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased? 
Then why has, you, has he led you by his spirit into the wilderness to suffer for 40 days? Why do he do that if he loves you? Why is he withholding something good from you? Is his word true? Is his purposes trustworthy? Can you put your trust in a father like that? Why don't you just take matters into your own hands and make some food for yourself? That would be a lot easier right now, Jesus. This is the tactic of the ages, I said, because it begins in the, in the garden. This is where Satan begins this game with humanity. The contrast can be different, of course. Adam and Eve were together. Uh, they weren't alone. Uh, they were living uh, in perfect harmony, it seems. Their bellies were full. The landscape was beautiful. Everything was perfect. And then Satan shows up. Did God really say you must not eat from in the garden? Then he goes on. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. What's the point? Is God really good? Isn't God withholding something from you? Can you trust a God who does this? Isn't he holding something good that's something that you would want to receive? And, and, and interestingly, our first parents agreed that God was withholding something good from them and he could not be trusted. His word was not good enough. And they fell, and they plunged the whole world into sin. The second Adam comes onto the scene. And the second Adam says, I'm not going to do what you asked me to do. Not because food is wrong. It's not wrong to eat when you are hungry. That would be crazy. But because Jesus was showing that his father is still good. He would not let the material world or his physical needs rule him. He would let the will and the word of God rule rule him. Theologians have said, had Jesus done this, he would have put material things over the spiritual, and all that matters would be the material world. And Jesus says, no, what matters is the spiritual world, and the spiritual world must dominate, must serve the material world. So he says, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. What's eternal, what's important is the word of God. That's my food and drink for my soul. I will wait on his timing for his, he is good. I will not turn that stone into bread. The devil had nothing on that one, so he moves on. He tempts him. He goes from, the, from the, the passions of the flesh, possibly, now to the lusts of the eyes. He's tempted by power and security. He takes him to a high place. We don't know where this high place is. Verse 5, And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of, kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to, to you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Wow. It should surprise you as you look at this temptation that Jesus does not refute his claim. The claim that Satan has all authority. Did you notice that? He didn't even refute it. He knows very well that it's a half-truth. Absolute authority still belongs to him. If Satan had all, all authority, why would the demons, his little minions, fear Jesus so much? Remember that story when he gets across the Gal Sea of Galilee and there's a man that's crazy, full of a whole pile of demons, and, and then the, and then the uh, demons beg Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. It's a crazy story something crazy all at the same time. But they're scared of Jesus and his power. But yet Jesus knows, so he doesn't refute the claim that Satan has, he knows that the devil is the prince of the air. He knows that he rules the kingdoms of the earth, that he blinds the minds of the unbeliever. That when the world was given over to Adam and Eve to subdue it, they basically, when they fell into sin, they handed it back to the devil. He has a lot of authority in this world. He's the prince of this age. And he's arguing, I can give you authority over all of these nations, Jesus. You just have to drop one knee. It can't be that difficult. 
just a slight genuflexion or genuflexion. It, that's all it takes. And, and the devil is, is not only tactical, and the devil doesn't always only prey on vulnerability. The, the, and the devil's not only an opportunist, the devil is also squirrely. You got squirrels here? We just threw them under the bus. The devil knew the scriptures. Psalm 2 was memorized by the devil. Psalm 2 says these words. He said to me, this is the father speaking to the son. You are my son. Today I have become your father. Now listen, ask me. This is fulfilling these words from Psalm 2. We all know that. We should all know that. If you don't know that, you know it now. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. That's, what's the prom- that's the promise that Jesus went with as he entered his ministry, that the ends of the earth would be his inheritance, that the ends of the earth would be his possession. And, and there was going to be a way, of course, the way of the cross to, to secure that end. And the devil runs interference and says, I have a better way for you. I can make it easier for you. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to suffer and die to be king. You don't have to walk the Via Della Rosa, the path of suffering to receive authority. Just bend the knee. Just do that right now. It's all yours. Suffering is not fun. And you know that, Jesus. Of course, if Jesus had turned and bent that knee, bent that knee even a little, our eternity would be forfeited, loved ones. The world would be an unsafe place for anyone to live. Darkness would have invaded Middle Earth. Now Jesus came to die, to pay the penalty of our sins, to secure the nations for his glory. And there was no easy road. There was no road that went around the cross. There was only one road, and it went straight to the cross. And he had that road marked out for him. Even before he began his ministry, he knew what he was doing and where he had to go. So he says, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. My will is to do the will of my Father. And the will of my Father was for me to come and die for my people. And everybody says, Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Well, the devil can't resist playing that card, you know that. He loves this card. If you just do this, you will get that. Every single temptation promises you more. If you just do this, you're going to be more satisfied. He plays that card every day. I read this or heard this story. A teenage boy a few years ago was interviewed by a journalist at a Satanist rally. I'm not sure what a teenage boy was doing that, doing there, but he was there. So the interviewer said, he was asked, why are you a Satan worshiper? Which is a very good question. And the boy's response was this, I think of the devil as a cool dude. Really? Because, he says, God restricts you, but the devil lets you do whatever you want. Somewhat true. God restricts you, but the devil, man, whatever you want to do is fair game for you. I'll give whatever you want, but the devil knows very well that what you want will ultimately destroy you. Remember that. What you want in your carnal self will ultimately destroy you. So you want to play fast and loose with the marriage bed? It will ultimately destroy you. It will begin to destroy your soul, and then it will, of course, destroy destroy your marriage. And unless Jesus intervenes and you repent of your sin, it will just just begin a pathway of destruction. For that moment of pleasure, there's a lifetime of destruction and pain. The devil knows that. But he keeps baiting God's people. You want to find solace in the bottle? The bottle will kill you. You want to keep trying to find happiness with buying more toys? It will possibly forfeit your eternity with Jesus. The devil knows that. You want to get rich quick by deception and tax evasion? It will destroy your integrity and destroy your life. And the devil knows that, but he keeps baiting. There are no shortcuts, loved ones. Listen, there are no shortcuts in the Christian life. There are no shortcuts to spiritual maturity. There's no easy victory. Remember that. 
Nothing's easy. Not in the Christian life. Not even a little bit. Listen, if Jesus had to go to the cross for our salvation and the road to glory was paved by, by pain and suffering for our salvation, do not think for a moment that the pathway to, to the Christian life, to the kingdom of heaven, is going to be easy for you. The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's his promise. Not the devil's. So we move from that to the last temptation. The status and fame. The pride of life. He took Jesus to a pinnacle. He says, and he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written that the angels will come and protect you. Now, we're not quite sure where he brought Jesus at that point, but there was this high point on, on the Temple Mount, at one of the walls of the temple, that uh, from this pinnacle all the way down uh, to the bottom of the Kindron Valley was about 450 feet. That's for all the Americans here. I don't know what that is in meters, actually, so we'll just stick with the feet. So the bottom of the Kindron Valley, that's a big drop. That would have been a quite a fall to see Jesus fall 450 feet. And you say, well, why the temple? Why did Satan bring him to the temple? Possibly because of the prophecy in Malachi 3 verse 1 that says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. So Something about the temple and that messenger, Jesus, is going to arrive at the temple. So why did Satan want to tempt him there? Maybe to see him destroyed. Or to see this huge spectacle of the angels coming down and swooping him up. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. That's a good way to start a ministry, I think. Could you imagine? All these people on their Instagram photographing this and sending it to all their friends. Look at this man. He's awesome. For all the wrong reasons. But what's interesting, Satan realizes that his only battle to be able to win Jesus over is to quote scripture. He's tried twice without quoting scripture. Turn this bread, turn the stone into bread, uh, bend the knee. He's like, okay, those didn't work, but maybe if I apply scripture to Jesus, Jesus will be bent by the promises of scripture and, and, and then follow my command. So he, he, he quotes from Psalm 90 to say these words, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike against your foot against the stone. He's a better theologian than any one of us put together. He's saying the Bible says if you trust the promises of God, he will protect you, Jesus. Do you believe the word of God, Jesus? Do you believe that this could be quite a spectacle and this could actually really ignite your ministry and serve the good of, of your ministry by the fame that you would get, Jesus? Now, Jesus knows that he's quoting Psalm 91. He knows that he's taking it completely out of context, so he's not really a theologian. This is a song of trusting God in the face of adversity, in the face of death, not tempting God. So, so Jesus responds to this guy, the devil, and says, um, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And neither should you, loved ones. Let me just be very, very practical about this because these temptations are applicable to our life today. Here are a few ways that we need to apply this text. If you go over the speed limit and pray at the same time that God will keep you safe or keep you from getting a ticket, you might be tempting the Lord your God. Or if you drive recklessly and then pray, God, please protect me as I drive recklessly. I, I just need to right now. I feel the urge. 
If you feed on pornography and then ask God to deliver you from lust, that's tempting the Lord your God. If you gossip and pray, God, keep that person I just gossiped about from finding out that I just gossiped about that person. Really? That's tempting the Lord your God. You don't walk into temptation and say, God, you know, I'm in the middle of this temptation because I kind of like doing this, but just please protect me and, and keep me safe in, while I exercise this. Do you trust the word enough to do what it says? That's the question that we need to answer. And Jesus says, I trust the word of God. And the word of God says, do not tempt the Lord your God. And Satan had nothing to say. So he left him. He left him not for good. He left him for an opportune time to attack him again. And we know opportune times will come again. He will use Peter. He's going to use Judas Iscariot to bring Jesus into, into the hands of his enemy. But I want to remind you this morning, loved ones, that even though Jesus won the battle, and ultimately he won the battle on the cross, defeating the devil, crushing his head, escaping the, breaking the chains of sin and bondage that he, it's the devil has placed around us, he's done all that for us by his death. Even though that is all true, the devil is still roaming around like a roaring lion. He's tethered, he's held back, and he's still roaring. And that's why Paul has the, the encouragement to say these words to the church in, in the Ephesus, and we're going to close with this. He says, finally be strong in the Lord and in the, in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, because the devil is real. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So, so what Paul's saying, you know what? The devil is real, but you can stand your ground. You do not need to be afraid of the devil. Do not submit to him. Submit to God's word. How? Peter will say, resist the devil and he will flee from you. He does not have absolute authority over you. No, Jesus does. So stand your ground. Study your word. Each temptation, as you know, was met with the word of God. It's your greatest weapon. Ephesians 6, verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And the devil has no power against his word. Satan left Jesus after Jesus spoke the word to him. Every time. The temptations changed. Why? Because the word was spoken. Martin Luther would say one word would fell him. One word of truth from the gospel is enough to send Satan running. Remember that. So, if that's the case, for God's people, not to be in the word is to welcome the devil and his minions to lead us. We as God's people need to be a people of the word. We need to know the word and we need to be able to memorize that word and we need to be able to use that word against all the temptations that we face in this common age. Finally, stay close to your Savior. Just stay close to him. He's the one who has conquered the devil, not you. Know that his spirit was sent to fill you, to live in you, so that you could resist temptation. Know that John says the one who is in you is stronger than he who is in the world. This is what it means to stay close to your Messiah, to your Savior, the one, the great victor, the great conqueror of the devil. To stay close to him is to be able to say by his spirit, the one who is in me is stronger than the one who is in the world. Praise the Lord. Remember, loved ones, as you as we close off here, that you're not alone in this battle that you're fighting until the day that you meet Jesus. You're not alone. Not only do we have the Word of God, we have Christ, our Savior, the Father caring for us, the Spirit leading us, and we have the communion of saints holding us accountable. We're in this together. We're not alone. And His promises never fail. He is with you, so in His power, by his spirit, continue to soldier on on the pathway to glory until it's all over and you meet your Savior. Amen. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for the grace that you've shown us. 
Lord, we live in this cosmic battle. We live in this reality that the devil is still prowling around like a roaring lion. He is seeking to devour us. He wants to have our faith for breakfast. He wants to trip us up. He wants to deny God. He wants to deny you your glory in and through your children. And so, Father, we thank you for the grace that has been given us. We thank you for the knowledge of what Christ has accomplished. And we thank you for your word, which is an anchor for our souls, which does not change. And it's true, and it's our sure and ready defense as we apply your word to the life that we live. Lord, we can withstand by your spirit the temptations of the devil. And we pray, bless us in that. Keep us close to you, each one of us, young and old in this age, until the day that we get to see you. And the day that you completely vanquish his power and send him running forevermore. In Jesus' name do we pray. Amen. We're going to...